Hi there, I'm uh, Chris Yoran. I'm the President and CEO of Superior Gold. And um, I'm having an interview today to tell the market a little bit about our story, the turnaround, and uh, what we potentially could expect for the future. Chris, good to see you again, buddy. Um, look, we caught up with you and had a sort of technical uh, analysis and due diligence session in December. I'll put a link to that below. And I think you had quite a good conversation earlier th uh, this week with Six. We'll put a link uh, to that because today I want to focus on the growth components, okay? And I want to understand what yes. you've been doing to be able to deliver that growth because this story has been stuck for some time before you came along. Uh, Tara, uh, came in and made a few changes. And I think, you know, you've had your feet under the table long enough now to kind of work out what's going on or, or, or have you. So, um, can we, can we talk about what you walked into? Just, just remind us what you walked into and what the brief was and how that's changed. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. So, um, I think what I'd like to do is take you back. When when Tamara took over the business, um, it was really on the back of a very difficult quarter in, in 2020, um, mid year 2020. We were on an annualized 60,000 ounces per year, really struggling. Cash flow was a challenge. I, I think our net cash position there was around 9 million US. Um, so, really troubling times for the business. Um, struggled with the underground mine, struggled with grade. Um, and, you know, um, it, it, it was an extremely tough time for the business. In essence, what Tamara started was putting in place a few basic things that will reposition uh, uh, the organization um, to settle it down to somewhere between 70 and 85,000 ounces of production. And at that stage, moving into 2021, our production guidance was 65 to 75,000 ounces. So what's had happened since then, we in fact achieved 77,000 ounces in 2021. It was really a story of the last three quarters um, hovering around 75, 77,000 ounces in Q2 and Q3, and then heading up in Q4 to 83,000 ounces annualized, which in essence gave us confidence that, you know, we're now reporting that the first goal of our three goal strategy um, have been delivered. And we're now moving on to the second goal, which is around building a business of scale, um, which I'm more than willing to talk about, you know, as we go on with the interview. Right. Okay. So you, um, you made a few, you, you, you were sort of basically delivering tomorrow's um, original vision for how this company can ch could change. Like I said, you've been, you've been here long enough to say, well, like, let's take a look at that plan and see if, see if I agree with all, all of that. Have you adapted, changed, enhanced, uh, or tweaked any of that? I mean, what, what, what's, what's, is anything different? Or are you just, are you yeah. just here to deliver a, a, the, the plan that you walked in? Well, it's, it's very interesting. When, when Tamara handed over the baton to me, um, someone put it out, put it very bluntly and I think very, very accurately in saying, you've been handed, you know, a box of toys. You just need to, choose which toys you're going to play with. So in essence, what Tamara did when she did the uh, strategic reviews, look at all the options that was out there for the business, but it was, wasn't taken down to that next step where the opportunities were reviewed and categorized and, of course, formalized and understanding what is the sequence of these opportunities or toys that we need to play with. Um, from my perspective, the one thing that I did see was the massive potential in the underground mine. Um, so we, we've upped the production up to 835,000 tons last year. This year, we're heading towards 900,000 tons delivered from stoping and development ore, and then ultimately moving on to an annualized rate in the second half of this year of a million ounces per year. And we want to see that grow up to 1.25 and 1.5 million tons. So, so that's the first thing that, that we've identified and we're pushing very hard for. The second thing is, of course, the open pits. Um, we've finished Plutonic East. We're now into Perch. And, and very interesting and I'm very excited about looking at the uh, main open pit. We've now identified a target within the main open pit, which we call main pit deeps, which we can access earlier. We don't have to wait for the main pit pushback, which will probably only come to bear in the next 18 to 24 months. It's an early entry. It's a short life, but it's a really good grade of ore that we can get there. And that... That fundamentally feeds into what we're targeting this year between 80 and 90,000 ounces, which is, which is quite a significant step up from what we did last year. And you're going to be able to do this from, from current cash flows, or are we stepping back into the market to be able to fund? Because it's quite aggressive, right? And with that, it's going to come a cost. So what can you tell us? 
So interesting enough, w- when we did the budget for this year, we had two scenarios that we identified. The one was really putting pedal to the metal and seeing, you know, how fast physically can we grow the underground mine and unlock the potential for the open pit. Needless to say, that needed a lot of cash. We trimmed that back and ultimately came up with a budget, which not only will deliver what I just said, but also will give us a you know, fair uh, uh, improvement on our cash position. So we're going to be cash generative, we expect this year, um, with our assumptions on cost as well as um, price for gold. Um, and in essence, with that also delivering a very strong base on which we can build into the next year as we progress further down our growth strategy. Right. So generating cash is one thing. Free cash flow is another. So, you know, what do you project and when can, when can we start understanding how you see the economics of this? So we will be announcing our financials um, for FY21 and give you a bit more insight into this year's financials, what we're targeting. In fact, we've already provided our guidance from a cost perspective. Um, and we, we uh, and, and you'll be able to see there that the, the guidance range that we've um, put out there for cost is lower than we had last year. Um, but I'm really looking forward to announcing our financials. We just need to hold on. I guess that's going to be available very early in March. In March, okay. I, I, I was going to ask. Okay, now, because and why? Why I think that's going to be important for people is because the range that you've indicated around costs is the case of if you if you can spend the money that you want to spend or have the money available to you to spend, those costs can be reduced quickly. Right, because you'll get exactly. the, the scale and, and the efficiencies, um, efficiencies there. If you if you can't allocate that capital, it's going to take a little a little bit longer. So, w- what's your mindset in terms of um, approaching that? Would you rather go and say to the market, "Hey, I need to raise a little bit of money, but it'll get us to where we need to be quicker." Or do you think, because of the history of the company, not not you, but the, the, the company, you're going to need to do things slow but sure? Yeah, I I think we're probably not moving slow. Um, What we are doing is we're moving forward in a measured and a cautious manner. And the reason for that is the business, unfortunately, has has a bit of a history of of, um, you know having you know fantastic aspirations, which nothing wrong with it, but you know falling short and delivering that. And and, you know the market has recognised that, and that's certainly not a position we want to be in. What we want to do is to make sure that we we build those foundations as we go along. Um, the investments that we're going to do in this year from the cash that we generate is going to be focused on two things. The one is around recapitalization of some of the kit, but then in addition, also investing into additional kit to be able to take our production rates up specifically around the underground mine and then unlocking the potential in some of our open pits. Um, needless to say, of course, um, main pit deeps, which is also going to draw some cash. Right. It, yeah, because you inherited a lot. There's a, you know, there's a, there's a big, there's a big, uh, Processing facility that you, you know you, that that needs to be fed, and we've talked in the past about whether you know you're going to be able to f- feed that, and at what point you're going to be able to completely feed that, and what do you do in the meantime? So won't we'll go over old ground there, but so you're going to have to invest in equipment. So this this is the this is the problem that some producers get into. They are producing enough cash to either put back in the ground or put into new equipment, and they're not making money. You. Your, your role is to make money because th- that's that's the name of the game for all businesses so uh, what, what what's the what's the game plan as you as you see it can you can, can we sort of broadly I get broadly talk about the path forward for the next two or three years as you see it yes absolutely so I, I really want to draw the attention on goal two and goal three of our growth strategy goal two is around building a business of scale moving up to hundred thousand ounces annualized and then moving up to 150. Getting up to 100 will be primarily unlocking two things. Firstly, the value in the underground mine, taking up to 900 million tons per year. In addition to that, also uh, moving from perch, which we're currently mining, into um, the um, uh, mine open pit deeps. And then also unlocking the main pit pushback, which is currently in PEA phase. So, so there's a lot of work we need to do there, which we believe in the next 18 to 24 months will come to fruition. And that'll be the mainstay of our feed into the first mill. Um, then moving up to 150,000 ounces means that we need to go and get additional ore, um, which we will be um, looking for outside of our um, borders. I mean, there's, we, we've got the unique opportunity, as you said, with the latent capacity in our mills to be able to draw in additional ore. Um, those conversations are currently underway, um, but these things do take time to be able to set that up. 
But in addition to that, and, and, and people will see it in our guidance, last year we guided between $30 and $40 of gold produced, um, ounces produced, spent on expiration this year, that's moved up to $90 to $100 per ounce produced. So a significant step up on expiration. I think the key there is not only um, doing our exploration underground, but we're now venturing into the surface areas, which, which as we've um, proposed before, um, there are large areas on our property which has been underexplored, and that's what we're currently unlocking. Because, I mean, there's, there's a scenario here, it's kind of like the sins of the father, right? Because they, the company, three, you know, two, three years ago was high grading and not reinvesting, right? Whereas you've kind of got to get the balance between if I'm going to if I'm going to talk to the market about hundred thousand ounces and beyond, you've kind of got you've got to deliver that, and you you got to be you got to get that balance between what you feed into the mill, right, and what you're targeting, right, the ore that you're getting buying in from elsewhere, right, uh, and what the exploration will will deliver, or what you go what you go chasing, right? Do you know what I mean? So, w- what's what's your experience tell you about the best way forward so you don't get kind of branded or labeled? I say with you know, with the sins of, sins of the father. Yeah, I, I think there's two things that I would like to call out there. The first thing is platonic and the ore body, uh, more specifically, is very complex. Um, and what I mean by complex, it's convoluted. So it's it's in all different sorts of directions. I mean, there's an area called Indian Access, which previously we drilled and we got nothing. Right, we went in there, did some um, further exploratory drill work. And we got a hundred percent hit rate in the same area, and the only thing was cha- we changed was our interpretation of where the ore is positioned in the underground. So, um, you know, th- and, and we reported on that um, in the second half of, uh, well, you know, I think it was the first half of, of December last year. Um, so, you know, um, the audience can go and read about that. So, so that that's in the future is also going to be another mining front for us. So, it's really about technically understanding what this spatial positioning or what we call form interpolation aspects of the underground mining. So it becomes you know, very technical from that perspective, but that's helped us better understand, not 100% you know, accurate, but better understand the spatial positioning of the ore um, in the underground, which, which you know, we're very excited about. Um, I think the key there is we're taking that work forward as we redefining our resource and reserve statement, and ultimately, of course, our life of mine plan, which will give us a much better indication as to you know, what the potential is and the rate at which we can grow, uh, for instance, the underground mine. Right. Okay. And um, to do all of the above, you've you've put a, you, you will I, I guess gives a, give a sense of you know the the plan of plan of attack in terms of number of drills, uh, how many meters. I'm just trying to put it in, in in language that people can understand or at least can compare um, to others. And so number of drills, number of meters planned. Um, it's precisely where you're going to be drilling this year. Um, is, when's that going to be laid out for everyone? We will be drilling uh, or spending on exploration to the tune of ninety to one hundred dollars per ounce produced, which puts us very well in line with what other companies are doing in this area. Which which gives me confidence that you know we, we're in the range where we should be. Number one, number two, um, our exploration underground is taking a next step, and we're very excited about it. Initially, we did all the drilling from current developments. What we're doing now is we, in fact, putting in the first purpose-built um, exploration drill drive um, in the Western Mining Front. And, and that shouldn't be an expri- uh, you know, surprise. The Western Mining Front is one of our major mining fronts as we go ahead. In addition to that, we've got three others planned. And the reason for that is ultimately to make sure that we shore up that resource and turn it into reserve so we can ultimately draw that into the mining plan um, and build that long-term life for the underground mine. From a surface perspective, um, we're using external contractors to do our, our surface drilling, um, not only on our own property, but also uh, we're looking at properties in the Bride Basin, um, specifically three areas that we'll be drilling in um, this year. Okay. And with regards to, here's a, we have lots of questions sent in as, as you'd expect, okay? Um, and as a sub hundred million dollar market cap company, um, I think you know some, some of the questions seem to be around why aren't you focused on increasing cash? Why are you doing so much exploration? So maybe talk about value creation versus cash in the context of your plan about how this company, as a sub hundred million dollar company, wanting you know you know aiming to produce a hundred thousand ounces this year, uh, which would, should put you in the five hundred million dollar category. Why are you focused on exploration and not short term cash? Well, firstly, we believe that the mine's got a much longer life than um, what what uh, meets the eye, and and 
you know, if, if, you, if you look at it from an investor's perspective, we've got 5 million ounces in resource, which is a fantastic number. However, our resource is only about 380,000 ounces. And if you're heading towards 100,000 ounces, that's, you know, less than three years and you're done. Um, so what we're trying to do is um, try and move as much ore as we can under the categorization of resource into reserve. Um, we're hopefully going to see that positive trend coming through um, as we announce a new resource and reserve statement. I think that's going to be a key element for investors out there to be able to see that this mine and this business has got a much longer life than you know what, what, what's currently out there. Um, in some of the interviews that I've had, I can I can appreciate some of the analysts saying, you know, how do you do a you know a DCF analysis on you know just over three years? It's it's really difficult. So you know that's one of our key goals to make sure that we demonstrate what we believe um, um, should be the mine life, um, that it's substantiated by proper technical analysis, and in fact we we've appointed an external objective organisation that'll be doing the verification and validation of that process. So the numbers that we we put out, we want to make sure that we can back them. Okay, and like I said, I will refer it again. We, we did a technical uh, an analysis and due diligence session with you in December. Please go look at the link um, if, because in the context of what Chris just said, I think it's important to understand that. Okay, the the other thing about um, you know, so coming into a turnaround situation, there's lots of things going on. You want to focus on the mining bit, there's, but there's also some uh, court cases that you got to deal with. So. <laughs> To, to Absolutely. It. Very important for us. Very important. Um, and, you know, we need to work through that. It's, it's just, you know, it's just part of the landscape we're operating in. It, it, it is. Is there any, any, any updates that you want to um, tell us about on that front? Yeah, it's, uh, look, it's, it's, it's difficult to be, you know, absolutely open exactly where we are on that. Um, you know, those uh, conversations is, is hopefully going to come to a head very soon um, over the next few weeks. Um, the, the, the uh, court case was was done and dusted last year, late last year. Um, so, um, and I know Vanga has made a uh, an announcement as to you know what the outcome was of that. Um, so, in essence, um, you know the two uh, situations or t- two events that that we specifically litigating on um, is is currently under discussion with uh, with the judge. So, you know, we, we need to wait and see exactly how that's going to pan out um, ultimately. Um, I, th- I think the key message there is or two things. The one thing is, this is not we're not going to allow this to distract us in any way of of our strategy. In in, in fact, our strategy is designed um, not taking anything into consideration insofar as Van Gogh is concerned. Um, and the second thing is, um, we've got nothing to lose at the end of the day. Um, our position um, is very clear, and uh, you know we 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 we're going to stand up for our position as as time goes on specifically insofar as this case is concerned. Okay, and, um, and so while on the subject of everything but mining, um, in terms of you, you guys are operating in a bubble within a bubble um, in, in Western Australia there, um, how are things on the ground? I mean, are things easing up in terms of, um, you know, fly in, fly out, in terms of uh, equipment, in terms of supply shortages? You know, how are you coping? Yeah, I, I think as far as normal day-to-day operations, we're really in a good position. I, I, I think the strategy that that the state government has followed has certainly supported the mining industry. However, um, what we are seeing is, and, and it's been like that for some time, because the borders are closed and we can't bring in um, external labour. If I say external, you know, it's very difficult for someone from the east to come into WA. Sometimes they can't come in or they have to isolate two weeks. In fact, our chief geo lives in Brisbane. Therefore, he needs to isolate, you know, when he comes back. And that changes from time to time. Um, so it's very difficult from that perspective. Um, I, I'm confident that, you know, the, as, as soon as the borders open, and, and we hope that will happen soon, um, it, it looks like the 5th of February hasn't turned out the way that we initially anticipated or were led to believe. However, I think that's a huge opportunity for us, and we're looking forward to, to the borders dropping, which means we'll be able to access the broader Australian market um, from a labour perspective. Um, but otherwise, I think we're doing, we're doing fairly well under the current circumstances. I don't think there's anything materially um, at risk at the moment um, with the current labour that we have. Right, and and has it restricted your ability to like, like I say you, you, right, you walked into a turnaround situation, right? Uh, those things are those things are tough because you know there's some inertia there. It's, 
on, on the ground, there's also inertia in the marketplace. And you made some, you know, big statements about what you what you want to try and do in terms of the numbers, the output, and you've you know, you, you've moved 65 to 77, you're aiming for 100, aiming uh, at 1,000 answers and, and beyond. Is there any restriction in your ability to hire the kinds of people that you think could help you deliver on that? I think um, accessing the people is is probably not the big issue. I, th I think it's more the question of how you access people, which, which continuously challenge the organization. Um, you know, for instance, um, in our safety transformation program, um, you know, we had to procure people right out of here at Perth to be able to enable them to go across uh, to the site, which, which brings along uh, certain uh, uh, issues. I think from a technical perspective, um, we're probably agnostic as to where that technical expertise sits and, and we're utilizing an ecosystem which is not only related to WA or Perth, but, you know, we're going across the country. In fact, as I said before, you know, there was one specific project we worked on last year which we had people working 24 hours around the clock. We had a team in the US, team in South Africa, and team in Australia working on the same uh, technical issue. So um, we, I, I think at the end of the day, it's horses for courses. And it's the, the challenge for the organization is to realize it's here to stay. And we need to think differently on how we, we, we secure uh, these services. Right. And, you, and obviously, with, with obviously the market as it is, but also your company as it was, you do you feel you need to, you need to overpay slightly to kind of get these people on board to take the chance to come on board um, to buy into your vision to be able to be part of the team who can, who can deliver this. But how do you go about setting up the the terms of re of compensation in a scenario like that? Because obviously you want to you want to reward um, success further down the line, clearly, that's the, you know, your shareholders would want mm -hmm. you to do that too, you know, but I say that in the context of the market where people are, you know, constantly surprised by how easy uh, those, those, those terms are to be, to be met. So how yes. you, you've walking into a tough situation here and you know, with your track record, you, I think you're cognizant of the fact that you've, you've got to play, play a straight, play with a straight bat, as they say in Australia. So how, how are you rewarding people? What are the targets that you're setting yourself and the rest of the, the, the team? So I, I think the key there is, is once again, thinking differently on how you procure the resources. And yes, yeah, certainly, you know, if you look at some of our peers, um, they go for the, you know, top level, um, operators, you know, they pay top dollar plus more for them. You know, our organization is a one single asset business. We need to be mindful of that. And the other thing is, I think that mining as a whole need to be mindful of is that, you know, as you increase the, 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 the pay scales that is locked in, you cannot revert back to a lower level. You know, it's, it kind of sets the new base and that ultimately turns into increasing mining cost and inflation over time. And we, and the mining industry needs to be aware of it. Our approach is is probably a little bit different in that yes we have a few key people that you know we incentivize uh, to stick with us and and that's got a very strong relationship with the business but importantly enough we, we're looking outside the mining industry to find people with the skills uh, uh, partially developed but also the learning ability that will be able to take up roles so we focus on bringing these younger people people with the potential into the business and training them up for the roles um, so we've gone along and identified typically what um, the career development path for these individuals would be to make sure that we bring them in at the appropriate level and then prepare them to take them up further for instance you know, we, we, we've had people joining us out of the uh, beauty industry, but they've got the skills of driving large trucks. So, sorry, so sorry, sorry, sorry. We've got, we, we got to stop there. Successful. What? <laughs> the beauty industry. <laughs> well, well, it's it's people that, that you know, along the, the, their life has, has ventured into other industries, but, you know, previously have, um, you know, uh, opened up uh, other potential avenues for their careers. For instance, you know, doing heavy truck driving, and that's exactly what we're looking for. So, you know, these people have been inculcated into our business and, and become truck drivers, whether it's on the open pit side or whether it's on the underground. So it's once again, you need to think differently because if you don't, you're just going to fall into this, you know, this, this, this um, gear set that just churns up the cost, that continuously churns up the cost. Some of the best dressed and most gorgeous truck drivers in the industry to be found at Superior Gold. <laughs> uh, right, right. Maybe I should have used another example. <laughs> no, this one's going to run and run. Um, 
Chris, look, great, great update. I um, appreciate it off the back of the December interview um, where, we, where we got a little bit more detailed and technical. Um, I look forward to you being able to talk about the financials, obviously, uh, in, in in March. That, that'd be really, yes. really cool. Um, and maybe hear a little bit more about some of the things that, that you are implementing in terms of this continued uh, up, upgrading of uh, what you've got in front of you and the opportunity ahead. Yep. Okay, mate. Thanks very much. Good to see you. Thank you very much. All the best. Cheers. Bye-bye.